I wrote to my father my senior year and I said, there's two things I'd really like to do. And first is to make you proud. And the second was to become commissioner of the NFL. And so I set my sights on trying to get into the NFL as an intern or anything. I was rejected a lot. Let's put it that way. I think it was over 50 times. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Roger Goodell, it's really an honor to have you on our podcast. You are the most underappreciated person in sports as the commissioner of the NFL. You have presided over the exponential growth and not only the profitability of the league, but the popularity, the dignity, and the safety of the game. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. It means a lot coming from you. Thank you. More on that later. Hey, Troy and I saw you hosting the NFL draft. I heard that you had back surgery, and I cringed when that behemoth put you in a bear hug. So we both felt for you. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was quite an experience. Listen, I, you know, Tim, everyone says, did we tell them to calm down? I didn't. I, you know, those, those young men have worked so hard for that moment, and uh, that's pure emotion when they come out on the stage. And so uh, I wanted them to do what they wanted to do. My back was good. Um, I got some hardware in there that's holding it in place. So it's, it, it may have hurt a little bit, but it always hurts. So it's okay, it, and, it, and it's, it's well worth it. I wouldn't get back one of those. Troy and I like to dig deep into our guests' pasts. I usually try to start with their childhood, but with you, I was just so fascinated by your father. He fought in two wars and got an undergraduate degree from Williams College, then two graduate degrees from Yale, including a law degree. Between the fighting, he was a sailor in the Great War and an officer in the Air Force in Korea. Then he comes home and becomes a lawyer until he gets appointed to Congress, wins four additional terms uh, by election, and is then appointed to the United States Senate by Governor Rockefeller. What was your relationship like with your father, and what was he like? He sounds like an incredible man. Uh, Tim, it's a great question. I, you know, I was really fortunate to have um, two incredible parents. Um, people talk a lot about my dad because of his public life, um, and that's deserving. He um, he was an extraordinary man. Uh, he was a great father, incredibly loving to uh, what, as you know, I'm one of five boys. Uh, so it was quite a big group. But he also, uh, he, he showed us every day how to live life. Uh, he wasn't perfect, but he had incredible courage. And that's the thing I always remember. He taught us how to do the right thing, uh, regardless of the consequences. And the best example I can give that of uh, to give you of that was in 68, shortly after he, he came into the Senate and actually up near your territory, he, he spent a lot of time going to colleges and listening to students uh, and hearing their perspective. And Cornell was particularly uh, influential on him. And he came back and said, I'm going to introduce legislation to end the Vietnam War. And he said, by doing that, I will likely lose the election uh, that was still about a year and a half to two years away um, because uh, President Nixon and the Republican administration will oppose uh, me for this. And uh, he was right. Uh, both the president and the vice president uh, took him on um, and essentially led to his defeat in the election in 1970. But it taught us a valuable lesson, which is do the right thing regardless of the consequences. Even when you know it may end up in a bad way for your career or for something else. 
if it's the right thing to do and that's your responsibility, then do it. And that served me really well as commissioner. When he first proposed that, did your did your mom or did your family push back and say, you know, even though that's what you think, let's try and let's not let's not rattle the cage of the president of the United it's, States? It's a good it's a good question, Troy. But, you know, being five boys in seven years, we were all fighters. So for us, it, um, you know, we were ready to fight the vice president and the president <laughs> and, and defending my dad. So um, we were we were all in. Um I don't know all of the conversations that may have happened but with my mom and dad, but I will tell you, my mom had every bit the strong characters, um, virtues and, and strength that he did. Uh, she was a remarkable woman and um, probably the biggest influence on me in my life. Until my wife, Jane, of course. <laughs> good, good save there. You have been quoted saying that your father placed an emphasis on doing the right thing no matter how unpopular it is. As you said, he famously backed that up going against President Nixon and his own Republican Party when he was in the Senate by calling for an end to the Vietnam War. It wasn't signed into law, but history proved that your father was right. I was told that you have the bill he sponsored for ending the war hanging up in your office. I do. It's actually right behind that plant over there to the right. Um, it's it's smaller and I can uh, give you guys a shot of it. But um, I actually walk through that uh, door uh, several times a day. So it's a great reminder for me to see it there because um, it it was certainly unpopular with the Republican administration, um, maybe less so publicly. Um, and, and to your point, it proved out to be very much the right thing to do. I only wish for thousands of lives and their families that it would have happened sooner. Um, but uh, I know that my dad did the right thing. Um, while he may have lost his Senate seat, he kept um, he kept his character. He kept um, a stance which I think is uh, irreplaceable, which is doing the right thing. Was he like that with with everything, Roger, or was it? Or do you think was that like a, just a too much for him to to handle the Vietnam War? Or was he like that with small stuff too? No, I'd say he he clearly was like that, Troy. Um, one of the things I learned from my dad. Uh, it took me a while, by the way, and probably many years after he passed, to really develop the ability to listen and learn and understand and to have some patience, particularly those that are critical of you. Um, you actually want to embrace that because I think that makes you stronger and makes you uh, more thoughtful. And if you believe strongly in something, uh, you should be prepared to put it out there and let people come back at it. So, I, you know, I, I think he lived his life um, by that North Star. And I think, fortunately, I think it was a big impression on all of us as kids. What was it like growing up as the middle child of five boys? I am envisioning lots of wrestling matches, cops and robbers, and just general pranks. Although it can be lonely in the middle where three is a crowd. Yeah, uh, my wife, Jane, likes to talk about birth order a lot. Uh, she's not surprised at all of sort of um, of what I've turned out to be, which is, you know, I'm pretty relentless. Um, I'm a fighter. Um, she would say stubborn, and that's probably fair, too. But I, I think you do. I think there's something to that. When you're five boys and seven years and you're in the middle, um, sometimes you get left out, sometimes you don't. But it's it, the Bottom line on it is we were all a very loving family, but we also, uh, as boys, as you know, it's just about fighting. Uh, we were, <laughs> we, we'd fight over everything. Uh, we'd play together, but we'd also uh, fight over it. And it was physical. And uh, fortunately, my mom was up to that because the one person we wouldn't mess with is my mom. Was your mom the disciplinarian of the house? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um I can remember, you know, my dad playing that role a couple of times. I think it hurt him more. My mom, you know, she had what they called the Rockefeller rule and a black belt. You did not want that to come out of the drawer. And so uh, we were all uh, we were all very much in fear of my mother. But we also knew she did it out of love. You guys, you mentioned that you guys, you know, fighting a lot, but I'm sure you, were you guys really close to growing up? Yeah, but competitive, I think, Troy, is the way I'd put it. You know, um, we would compete in sports. Um, we would compete in a lot of different areas. And um, 
But if you if you were outside our five, um, we could mess with each other. But if somebody messed with on, from the outside on one of the five, that that you'd get all the Goodell boys behind that. And I'm the smallest of all the five, by the far, by way, by a, by a long shot. And um, that was not probably something you wanted to take on. So we protected our own, but internally, uh, we would take it up. We'd be pretty hard on one another. That sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar too, I'm sure, Troy. Yeah, we've got five, and I'm I'm in the middle. So I didn't I didn't know we're both middle of five. Now I got I got I got to cross off some of my hard questions here. I got to take it. Uh, in. Troy, my money's on Tate. Okay, that's all <laughs> I can say. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> I know that you fell in love with football as a kid growing up in D.C. as a Washington fan. I was a big Washington fan too. When I was in college, I was thrilled to meet Len Dawson when he and Kurt got to announce our upset win over number one ranked Nebraska. But I digress. Did you play in any youth league or did you not play football until you got a little older? Yes, I played in the uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Police Athletic League. Um, and I started, I think, in fourth grade, I believe. It might have been third grade. Um, loved playing the game. Uh, that's where I fell in love with it. But, you know, in, interesting in those years, uh, while I loved football all year round, when I was playing in the basketball season, I loved basketball. When I was playing in baseball, I loved baseball. So, you know, I, I love multiple sports, and uh, it's one of the things I encourage kids to do all the time is play multiple sports. I, I think it's good for you to understand what each of those sports bring to you, and um, I actually think it makes you a better athlete ultimately. But football had something that um, was much more appealing to me. I, I think it was a combination of the physical side of it um, as well as the strategy. And uh, I love that. I love the challenge of it. I love the teamwork of it. And um, it still carries me today. Well, in youth league, you play just about anything they tell you. Um, as, I, as I got a little further, I was a quarterback for a while, and I moved to um, you played two ways. I played two ways all the way through. So I played a lot of um, defensive back uh, safety and a couple times linebacker. And then I, in high school, I moved to tight end because I was moved to running back in my senior year. And uh, we had a young man in the next town that uh, their, their school um, went on an austerity program. So they lost their football program. So he came over and he was a far better running back than me. So I moved to tight end and he came in and uh, he was a much better player than I was. So it was, it was an easy move for me. I understand in Bronxville, where you were captain of the football, basketball, and baseball team, you enacted a no alcohol policy. Your senior year, some teammates were drinking. As the captain, you were expected to tell the coach and were criticized for doing the right thing. I'm curious about your experience because I had almost the exact same thing happen to me. And it made me almost belligerent about doing the right thing going forward. Yeah, we called it uh, the pledge, uh, Tim. We all signed it um, prior to the season. And it was something that I took um, seriously. Um, I wasn't much of a drinker in high school. Uh, drugs were not my thing. Um, so I, I took it really seriously as a responsibility of our team. And frankly, a responsibility to one another, really. Um, and so... Yeah, it was it was hard uh, at times. Uh, I'm sure there were a lot of parties I was left out of from, but um, you know, I I think the guys um, the guys respected it enough because we all signed it, and um, ultimately, to your point, uh, I was voted on by those same players to be captain. So um, I I hope at least, and I'm still in great touch with them, and consider all of them lifelong friends. Um, uh, you know, they, they understood it, and I don't think it was an issue at all. Um, my high school years were great years. Was there a lot of blowback socially, like in school versus the team? No, not at all. I think, you know, I think, uh, again, it's pr pretty hard to argue when your responsibility is one thing and you sign something um, as an individual, um, you know, that's – that's the way it works, right? We all work by rules and we all work by our commitments. And so that wasn't, that wasn't hard at all. I might probably say I probably got invited to a few less parties though, Troy. 
How was Bronxville's record while you were there? What kind of guy was your football coach? Um, a senior year, we had a coach, uh, a senior, junior and senior year uh, and sophomore year, a coach uh, named Vito Priori, um, who was fantastic. Uh, one of those guys who could get you revved up. He was great about uh, working with everybody. Um, he just, he just said uh, pride, sacrifice, and desire was his, was his phrase that he would talk about. And he, he drilled that into us in a way that was really positive and influential throughout our lives. I think every one of the guys that played for him would say that. Um, but we had, a, we had a very competitive team every year. Uh, we didn't do as well in my senior year that um, I think we all hoped. Uh, we thought we could do better than we did, but uh, every year we were competitive against everyone, and uh, we just didn't. We were hoping to win, the, to get into the states, and go that far, but we didn't make it. How much of those lessons he taught you would you say you still carry on today? I, I would say this, Troy. I, I I would say my coaches in sports, and uh, that includes youth all the way, you know, through high school. Um, they were outside of family were probably the most influential people to me. I mean, I had teachers that were great, but I, I must admit um, school was not my focus. Uh, academics was not something I really spent a great deal of time and was probably the biggest mistake I made in those years. But I was, I, I loved sports. And so my coaches ended up being one of the most influential um, or the most influential people in my lives. Because of, I think they all taught me a lot about myself, but they also taught me a lot about what I could be and um, what sports could do in that context. So I'm grateful to every one of them. Were you similar? Were you similar to like how you are now as a person at that point? It sounds like you were pretty. Um, I don't know the right word. It sounds like you're pretty mature, I guess, <laughs> at that age. <laughs> I well, I was a little bit of a troublemaker, but not in a bad way. My mom would always go down to school and says, I know he's making trouble. But um, and, you know, my mom was, um, as I said, you know, she was loving and supportive, but she was also um, she wanted everyone to understand there were consequences to your actions. So, you know, she was always wondering how I was doing, what I was doing. And uh, again, we felt that support and that love. But we also felt that discipline. Um, and so, no, I don't think I was a lot different. Honestly, Troy, um, I didn't apply myself academically. I changed that when I went to college. Uh, the first thing I did was teach myself all the things I should have learned in high school uh, and learned how to study and how to work. And when I came into college, I, I never worked harder, harder academically. I, I would say my freshman year of college, I worked harder than I did in probably the six or seven prior years. I had to. <laughs> what was your proudest moment as a player? Wow. Um, you know, to some extent, I would say um, uh, doing what was right for the team in a, in a way. You know, I was captain of the football team. And as I mentioned, a, a, what has been a lifelong friend of mine, Jim Roberson, came into the uh, to our program very late uh, in the preseason. And because the school went austerity and I knew him because we worked together in the summers at the school as janitors. And um, we very much wanted him to come play for us. And he happened to be the first black student probably in Bronxville High School history. Um, and he was a better running back. And so it was an easy decision for me to say, you know, that's where he belongs. Uh, I'll go block for him. And that's what was right for the team. So, you know, I think it was proud that he came over, uh, that he contributed so much to our team and to our school, and um, that, uh, you know, I was a part of that. I, and as I said, we're friends to this day, and I, I appreciate that. So you're a star athlete in high school, named Most Athletic, and several colleges recruit you. You end up picking Washington and Jefferson, which founded in 1781, I think. I also read that they played in the Rose Bowl in 1922, which ended in a zero to zero tie and they split the national championship with Cal. Did you know that? Uh, I didn't. Uh, then I learned also we had uh, one of the early uh, Hall of Famers, a guy named Wilbur Pete Henry, um, played at WJ and is a NFL Hall of Famer, Pro Football Hall of Famer. And so 
they've got a proud history of football. Um, the head coach that was there when I was there actually went on to be a scout at, um, at the Seattle Seahawks, um, Pat Mondock. Um, and actually the head coach, I believe today is actually a brother of the Philadelphia Eagles coach. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it's got a proud history of football. Um, I really got to the point where my focus at that stage was um, focusing more on the academic side. I really flipped and, and said, you know, I want to think about this long term and I want to I actually want to work in football in some fashion. And working for Pete Rozelle became uh, my goal and my focus. I really was not knowing where, really what the opportunities were. I was um, infatuated with Pete Rozelle, who was a commissioner at the time. Uh, you know, I read everything about him. I thought a lot about what he was doing, studied it every opportunity. And um, I think at that point in time, I decided I'd really like to work for him. Um, I, it's uh, true when I graduated and I had the letter, I wrote to my father, my senior year and I said there's two things I'd really like to do and first is to make you proud and the second was to become commissioner of the NFL which was a pretty silly thing to say at the time because I think there were only six commissioners at that point and um, I wasn't even employed by them and so I set my sights on trying to get into the NFL as an intern or anything uh, just open the door or to a club and um I was rejected a lot. Let's put it that way. I think it was over 50 times. So. Where, where do you think that fascination came from? Because it is a very specific thing, right, For uh, especially as an yeah. athlete. Yeah, it's, it's really unusual, Troy. And I, 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 you know, when I talk to the younger generation about it, as you know, it's not very common for someone to um, get out of college and go into a career that they stay with their entire lifetime. I had one brief stint because I couldn't get into the NFL and the steel industry right after I graduated because I needed to work. Um, and that was useful to me. It was in a management training program as the steel industry was really going through challenging times. So I, I really got a lot out of that experience. But I got an internship, uh, which would have been the year after I graduated for four months in the NFL. So it was 1982. Um, and I don't know what drew me to that so much and why I was so focused on it. Uh, I'm fortunate that was the case. But I think it was just uh, my love of the game, my recognition that um, I really wasn't going to play at that point in my life um, and that this was a way I could contribute to the success of the NFL if I could get in the door. And so I just um, I focused on that. And fortunately, they gave me that opportunity with a four-month internship. Then, in high school, you had a nasty injury. And that was back when surgeries were a crapshoot and you never ended up playing football again. Was that the lowest point in your life? If not, what was? Well, clearly the lowest point in my life was losing my parents. Um, that was uh, the most difficult part. Um, my mom died in 84 and my dad died three years later in 87. And I was still um, in the 28, 25 range for both of those deaths. And they were really hard. I didn't think I could go on without my parents. But so that was clearly the lowest point um, in my life. Um, you know, regarding the football injury, no, I think, it, you know, it was a point in time to your, your point, which is I was just going to college. Um, I thought seriously about going to Pitt. Uh, Jackie Sherrill had recruited me and when I had that injury, um, the surgeries, to your point, um, the medical advancements were, were far what they are today. The arthroscopic surgery was just beginning. Uh, and I just, you know, I think it was that, that inflection point that maybe everybody gets to in life. Uh, I just felt like it was time for me to grow up and sort of get to the, to the academic side and to focus on long term. But I will say this, it, it may be the single biggest regret I have from that period of life is that I didn't play college football. Why do you say that? I don't know. I don't have any regrets in life, but I, um, I love the game so much. So I wish I had because, you know, I would have had a limited time to do that. Um, 
I so enjoyed it uh, through my high school years that I, I wish I had continued to do it. If you had played in, in college, what were you, were you going to stay at tight end or were you going to switch to uh, a different? Position? No, I would have been a safety, I'm sure. Um, and depending on the level of uh, of play, it, um, I, I think safety would have been my position. But if you'd played, you might not have been able to focus on the academics and get the NFL internship. <laughs> yeah, I listen, uh, as I said before, you know, when I went to college, I had to teach myself how to learn. I had to teach myself how to study. I had to teach myself a lot of things that I should have learned learned in high school. And so I had to work extra hard. And one of the things I did learn from sports, I can remember running around the track um, at our high school and actually in Bronxville. And I remember the exact moment is uh, somebody passed me. Um, somebody was a faster runner. And I, and I thought to myself at that moment, they're going to be guys that are faster. They're going to be people that are smarter. But there's going to be nobody who can outwork me. And that's what I discovered. All I had to do was just work harder than anybody else because I knew I could control that. And I knew I could do that better than anybody else. The reason I ask about the low point is because my low point is when I got the news that I had ALS. I was crushed. But slowly, over time, my Christian faith flourished and I began to look at things through a new lens. I looked at my illness as a second chance. Suddenly, my life slowed down and I saw a greater purpose of helping others. Your generosity blows me away. You do so much for other people. Soldiers, breast cancer patients, ALS research, kids. I can't even count the charities you support. I'm not just talking about the NFL's money, but your own money. I'm wondering if you ever had something like the religious epiphany I had. Yeah, in many ways. Um, I, I must tell you, Tim, you know, I grew up, um, we went to the National Cathedral every week, and my mom um, was probably more religious than my father, but we went every week with five boys all dressed up. And um, I got to tell you, when my parents died, I was angry at God. Uh, that, was a, that, was a, that was a moment where, I couldn't get through that anger of why they would take my parents, why God would take my parents uh, at such a young age. My mom was 53. My dad was 60. Um, and that was hard for me. And it took a, a long period of time for me to, to get over that and to understand um, maybe a little bit more of the workings of God. And I was looking at from a selfish standpoint and to your point, when we get dealt a bad hand, it's the time to s step back and sort of say, what can we do with this? What inspiration can we be? What kind of change maker can we be? And take advantage of the opportunity God gives us when he does throw those bad things at us. And you're, uh, you're my inspiration on that. As long as the way you've taken this illness and sort of used it as an inspiration for so many other things and continue to have the impact you do is, is off the charts, Tim. Roger, I'm just curious because it's very personal, so uh, you don't have to answer, but what got you over that hurdle from kind of anger to maybe leaning into religion after your parents <laughs> passed? I just think faith is an important thing. Um, I had a lot of people, uh, including um, a very dear friend named Will Terry, who is actually a dean of students at Davidson College, who actually uh, married me, but also buried both of my parents, who was a close friend. And he, uh, he actually understood it. And I, I would say probably helped me through that a little bit to sort of say, you're looking at it wrong. Um, he didn't say it in that way, but he helped me find that path. Um, and just, again, you have to use those, um, those challenges in life um, and, and you have to overcome them by figuring out how to make something positive of it, just like your father does every day. Did that surgery we spoke about earlier push you down the path of academics and trying to become the commissioner of the NFL? As you said, you weren't that interested in school until college. Then you became just relentless on your quest to become commissioner. It's such a big mental shift to make at 18 years old. I know. Listen, I had um, four brothers who were all um, incredibly smart, did incredibly well in school. I didn't come anywhere near my um, potential is a nice way of saying it. Um, 
And so I, I just, I felt like I needed to prove uh, to my family uh, as, to, as well as to others that I could do well in school, that I, um, I needed to change my approach on the academic side um, and maybe prove to myself uh, that I could do it. That's probably even more important. And so I think it was a factor of those. I think the injury was a, was one of those moments to sort of decide which way are you going to go? And um, I chose this path. I think it was the right one because I, it, it did help build confidence in myself that I could do this, um, that I could achieve that kind of success. Um, I wish I hadn't put myself so far in the hole um, because I, I do the amount of work I had to do to sort of get to that place was, was more than it should have been. But I don't have any regrets in life uh, with, with maybe the one exception of not playing college football. Roger, did you have a, like a role model or maybe it was your, uh, your parents? Because it seems like to make that decision at 18, 19, however old you were when you were in college, I mean, it's, it's very you know, wise beyond the typical kid. You know, Troy, I don't. I, I have um, incredible mentors. I'd call them uh, in my life. Uh, my parents were clearly there. My brothers, um, other relatives, um, but I don't know um, if it was so much that I was role modeling myself after them as it was. Um, I didn't want to let those people down. I didn't want uh, any of them to be um, disappointed in Roger. And that I didn't realize my potential and that um, probably felt that more towards my mother. Um, I know my mother was never disappointed in me, but probably uh, I wanted to, to really make her proud and make her understand that I could do this. And um, that was a real driving force for me. And my father, too, but my mother, most important. Could you tell us the story about how you broke into the NFL and your ascension to the top? Don't be modest because it is a great story of both persistence and perseverance. Well, Tim, um, it, it probably starts a little bit on, um, you know, I mentioned the number of times that I wrote letters and tried to reach people who, you know, I could get an opportunity somewhere in the NFL, either at the club level. And um, and I, I do believe the number, of my recollection is 53 rejections. So I, I learned how to deal with rejection. Um, but I finally had um, the story. I was in Pittsburgh and um, I finally called to follow up on a letter and I was careful to not cross over to the line of being a pain in the ass. I was trying to be persistent and not cross. But the executive director of the NFL, a gentleman named Don Weiss, um, picked up the phone and he said, listen, if you're in town, come on by. And I said, well, I happen to be in town. Um and that was a white lie, by the way, and because I was in Pittsburgh and he was in New York. And he said, OK, come by at eight o'clock tomorrow. So I drove all night from Pittsburgh to get there. And I was there at eight o'clock in the morning and we had the meeting and, you know, I kept after him a little bit. And then, uh, you know, a couple months later, uh, he sent me a note, that said, we have an internship program. Uh, we'll offer you a position. It's a four month internship. It was during the season of, I got to go back 1982. And I started somewhere around September one. Uh, and the next week, uh, the players went on strike for two and a half months of that four months. And I thought, well, there goes, there goes this opportunity. But fortunately, they kept me on. And they, um, I stayed on as an intern for almost two years. The next season, um, the Jets had an opening late in the season for an intern at the, at, the, at the Jets team. And so I went out there and did that for the season, which is a great experience for me because I, I got close to many of the players, to the executives. I understood what it was like to be on the team level. And actually, at the end of that season, the defensive coach, the coordinator, was a guy named Joe Gardy. And Joe um, said, would you like to stay around and be a defensive assistant coach? And I thought really hard about it. Um, and I still think back about it. 
And I said, no, I think, I think I'm going to go back to the league office. Um, I don't know the future there. I'm still an intern, but um, I think that's where my path is. And I went back and it was uh, about another year before I became a full-time employee at the NFL as a public relations assistant. And um, I will say this, Tim, just on a broad level, I was really fortunate to have a lot of great people I worked with, but also a lot of great people gave me opportunity. Um, gave me guidance. Um, it wouldn't have happened without that. What did you do with that year on the Jets? Like, what were you specifically doing as an intern? <laughs> Trey, you don't want to know all the things I had to do. I, literally, the, the primary thing was I was the lowest of low uh, in the PR department. My main focus was I would line up the players for interviews after practice. So I had to, to spend a lot of time in the locker room and try to convince players to come out and do this interview or that interview. Um, on weekends, I travel with the team, and then um, I was a radio spotter for the the radio team. So I got a little exposure to media. Um, but again, it was the most valuable thing to me was the people I worked with over there that are still really um, influential in my life and. Um, to have that perspective be on the team actually helped me when I went to the league because not many people had that perspective of what it's like to be on a team. And it was not the best season for the Jets. There were high hopes. They went to the championship game the year before, and the next year was um, was not their best on the field. If you had stayed, I know it's just hypotheticals, but if you had stayed in the Jets as a defensive assistant, when you were thinking about that, path obviously you chose to go back to the league but were you were your aspirations as a, a coordinator or head coach or were you still thinking you would go down that road and come back to le the league office eventually i hate to be so frank about it troy but uh i don't think i thought of the food that much um you know i love the game of football so the idea of of being a, a coach um and I, again i would have been on the lowest level of a coach um but that was intriguing to me because I would have been close to the game and it, it would have been really interesting. But I guess there was something that just pulled me back to the path that I went to, um, which is staying within. I wanted to pursue a career at the league level in the commissioner's office. It seems like such a gamble, though, for an internship at the league office versus the defensive coach kind of giving you a full-time GA or whatever the right terminology would be job. It seems like such a gamble. I mean, betting on yourself, which obviously you did driving through the night from Pittsburgh to New York. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it's such a Yeah, no, it, it probably would not have been the best uh, career decision, but I, you know, I laugh about it with some of the players now and they, you know, they all say you made the right decision, kid. <laughs> and it's pretty, pretty hard to argue with that. So now the real test when did you first meet your wife, Jane, and which was harder to attain, Jane's hand in marriage or the NFL commissioner job? <laughs> Without question, Jane's hand in marriage, but also the more rewarding of the two. Uh, uh, she has been my, um, I fell in love with her the moment I met her. Uh, I was, um, some people would say a confirmed bachelor. I think I was 36 at the time when I met her. Um, and, um, I sat down at dinner and she was two seats away from me and my best buddy was at the table behind me. And I literally, without saying a word to her, leaned back and told him, I'm going to marry this woman. And I don't think I've ever said that in my life. Um, but she didn't have the same plans. Let's put it that way, Tim. It took me probably a year to get a date with her. <laughs> so, uh, she lived in Milwaukee and I lived in New York. Um, fortunately, um, our past crossed enough, and I guess persistence was the right word, which wasn't necessarily my greatest attribute when it came to dating. Um, but there was something about Jane that I knew. I knew she'd be important in my life, and she has been. And we we're fortunate to have two wonderful daughters and a great family. So we're very lucky. She didn't know what she was dealing with. She never stood a chance. <laughs> Uh, Tim, it's a good point, but if she had known what she was dealing with, she would have definitely run the other way. <laughs> Getting back to the NFL, we talked about tough decisions and doing the right thing, no matter how unpopular the decision was. I also said I admired your bringing dignity to the NFL. 
you've had to dish out some tough love. What has been the toughest incident you've had to deal with? Wow. You know, uh, from a broad standpoint, and this will sound funny, and then I'll give you um, maybe a couple of specifics. Um, and I said this to the ownership when I went for the commissioner's job. I said the biggest challenge for this league is going to be dealing with success. Um, just because we've had the success we've had today doesn't mean it will continue. And one of the things you really have to do is have this commitment to getting better and to find new ways of making the NFL more popular with more fans and, and to continue to, to build the game into a better game. And I, um, I would say the two specific challenges uh, when I came in were, uh, one, the labor agreement. Um, we had just signed a new labor agreement in 2006. Um, that was a five-year deal. Um, we optioned out of that labor agreement, I believe it was in late 2008. And preparing to um, have a work stoppage and a, and a lockout in particular, which was a decision made by the NFL owners and me. Um, and that's really hard to, to basically shut down the NFL. Um, and yours truly felt that burden. And it was clearly unpopular. Uh, it, it, and it was unpopular with our fans. But we knew we had to revise the CBA. We knew that was the only way we were going to be able to, to grow as a league and to um, – the challenge was to make sure the CBA addressed the issues where uh, the, the owners and the clubs could uh, continue to or find success and be able to invest in the future, but also allow the players to participate in that uh, and share in that growth. And I think we found that. And the fact that we ended up with a 10-year labor agreement that was incredibly successful and before that even expired, we agreed to another 10-year agreement on top of it. Um, I think it, is, it, to me, was the foundation of what we were able to build as a league and any of the success we had, whether it was on the media front or on improving the game um, or the safety of the game. Uh, and all of that was – the foundation was built through a very difficult period of that lockout, but also um, – the agreement itself that came from that and the partnership that came with that from the players, I think is, is why we've seen the success that we've seen. Is that one of your proudest changes you made as the commissioner? Uh, I think it's one of them uh, clearly making the game safer for our players. And again, uh, you know, you take a lot of barbs with that because people thought you were changing the game. People thought you, you know, you'd hear it all the time. You're changing the game. You're making it soft. Um, but your dad would know, you know, there's nothing soft about this game. It's, it's played by, you know, it's, uh, guys that are getting bigger and faster. It's an incredibly physical game. And, um, we just felt that there were techniques that we could remove from the game. So I, I think the safety of the game and the medical, uh, support that we're giving our teams and our players now, uh, I'm incredibly proud of it. And I'm also in incredibly proud of the way we got through the COVID year. Uh, you know, the, there, weren't, there weren't too many people who thought we could play through the COVID year. As a matter of fact, I can only think of one. <laughs> and, and the reality is um, we did. And we did it um, through perseverance. We did it through an incredible partnership with the players, with our medical experts, um, with our partners, including in the media. And we did it, and I think it really led to um, an important inflection for our country. I think it was important for us to give hope whatever way we could through football that the world was going to return, that we were going to work our way through this. Um, somebody reminded me last week of having the draft. Um, we had to cancel the, the draft. I believe it was uh, – might have been in Las Vegas. but. Um, we had to cancel the draft and try to figure out how we were going to go forward. And my issue was to stay on time, on schedule, that we couldn't just put things off and let that back up. So we went to a virtual draft and I ended up doing it in, our, in my basement. Um, but again, I thought that was a really pivotal moment um, because I think our country needed it. We were, we were at a, a really low point. 
And people needed to believe that we could go forward. And I think that draft, I, I hear from so many people, I think that draft had an impact well beyond football and well beyond the draft of doing exactly that. Yeah, it was very, I, we watched the draft every year. We're one of those, we're one of those kind of fans, but we, it was a very, uh, it was like very authentic draft because it was literally you in your basement. You could tell it was like very, you know, you guys had to kind of struggle your way through it. And I think to your point of the message it sends to the country of the NFL, the shield is like a bigger, you know, larger than life kind of emblem now, you know, it, it, it people say like it, it uh, owns a day of the week for them to be kind of struggling to find a way to make it through. It kind of, it did, it did have that message. I think I agree with you. Well, we had a lot of white house briefings and this was something different, right? And it was, a, it was an opportunity to say there is a future for all of us and, and we're going to get back to normal uh, operations, even though the 2020 season was far from normal. We did get through it. We started on time. We ended on time. We, we played every game. You said you didn't, no one thought you could do it, but one person, you kind of chuckled. Who was the one person? You're looking at him, Troy. <laughs> uh, I, I think people thought I was crazy. I just, I don't know. You know, sometimes you have to believe things before they can happen. And if you don't have a belief, more than, more than usual, they're not going to happen. And, you know, I've always felt that that was the starting point. And I, I believe we could play. You know, were there times of doubt? Sure. Because we were dealing with a lot of things we really didn't know enough about. So I can't tell you that I uh, was 100% confident all the way through. But I believe if we stayed at it, we could work our way through it. And you, you mentioned a couple of times the, the draft earlier on with your, your back surgery and getting bear hugged and then, you know, the, the 2020 <laughs> draft. Was that one of your favorite parts or, is, or what is your favorite part, I guess, of being the commissioner? Well, that, that, that is one of my favorite moments of being commissioner because, you know, you're out there on the stage and, and these young men get drafted and it's the start of their NFL career. And that emotion that they show um, that's not staged. I mean, that, that, you know, they come out and I have no idea what they're going to do uh, with the exception of a couple of the handshakes once in a while, they always say, when you do this first and, and then um, their emotion takes over and you see that. And to be part of that, that just that moment for a little bit, when they come out on stage and they're introduced as a, you know, an NFL player for a particular team, I'll never let that go. That you know that that's probably the most important moment for me in any year. I know there's probably uh, hundreds, but is there one that particularly stands out as like an unforgettable one for you? Um, no, I think um, Gerald McCoy is the one I probably give um, the most credit to of starting the draft hugs, though. Um, and I need to ask you all this, but I think he lost his mother or his grandmother uh, somewhere close to the draft. And his emotion came out really quickly. Uh, and he grabbed me and he grabbed me hard, but you could feel his emotion. And, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't anything more than it, it was just I could feel raw feelings for him and that that sort of started it I think and it just sort of built from there and and a lot of times the guys are really truly emotional and um, even if they know where they're going to be picked there's emotion and and I think that's um, that's a great thing for them so when it when it came to last week uh, I thought that was sort of my duty to sort of be there to let them have that moment and um I wasn't worried that my back was going to get worse. Um, was it going to be a little uncomfortable? Yeah, maybe, but it was worth it. And then you also mentioned that we, we can move on, I swear, but <laughs> you mentioned the rule changes and the pushback you get from fans and changing the game. Can you talk about just high level? I know it'd probably take a lot longer than we have for this call, but just high level, like taking the, the kickoff change that's happening for the upcoming season. How does that how does that uh, like? What's the the short version, the elevator, the elevator uh, pitch of that? The life cycle of that idea, getting it approved, and how much you know say in it you have, or how that works. Well, Troy, high level. I think our job is to 
continue to make our game competitive, make it exciting, and make it safe. So our focus has been on rule changes. Every year we evaluate every one of them through our competition committee and the membership. Um, and we bring forth things that we think will, will improve safety. And so we've had nearly 60 rule changes since I've been commissioner, I think, so that have helped in the safety of the game. Um, and then also to, to make it competitive, the, the kickoff for the last couple of years has gone down to the point where this past season, we only had 22% of our kicks returned. So, you know, it almost becomes irrelevant. It's, it's not a lot different than where we were with the extra point where, you know, we were up to like 98 or 90% were, were, were successful extra points. We wanted to add challenge to that. So we moved it back and you had to kick from further back and it brought it down to the 92%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's real. Uh, it's not a, it's not an automatic. And the same thing with the kickoff. We wanted to bring that play back. It's an exciting play. Um, but we knew the injury rate was higher in that play. We wanted to do it safer. So we had to rethink it. So we, we challenged our special teams coaches to come up with alternatives. Uh, they worked really hard. They did a great job. They presented something to the competition committee that the committee supported. And then we brought it to the membership. And, you know, the reception on the floor was, was positive, but not enough. And we really spent a lot of time talking with the ownership about this is our role to be guardians of the game and to make sure we continue to make our game safer and more exciting. We need to do this type of thing to do that. And we passed it with, I think, one or two no votes. But I think the ultimate challenge is going to be for us to, to keep doing those kinds of things and making our game safer and more exciting. Colin Kaepernick was a tough one. I fully supported your decision when he initially knelt for the national anthem. In the moment, I was outraged. But when the George Floyd situation unfolded, I thought your reversal on that decision was right as well. A lesser man would not have been able to admit that he was wrong. I think that whole situation would have made your dad proud. Well, Tim, um, you know, the thing that troubled me the most during the Colin Kaepernick is that I think um, the media and the public and and probably many others misrepresented what the players were really doing, which was not trying to be unpatriotic or disrespectful to the flag, but rather to talk about the things that are going on in our communities and how we all had to, to, to see that. That was uh, the bravery of Colin Kaepernick and many other players that took that stand. Um, Listen, I'm, I'm a big one on the flag, and one of my favorite moments is the national anthem before a sporting event. But you had to understand what they were doing. And um, I think we were able to understand enough of what the players uh, were focused on. And this, this started well before that. This goes all the way back to Missouri in, I think, 2014. Um, our players really wanted to partner with the NFL to bring attention to that, to, to, to do important work, to bring justice to the very, um, the people who didn't have that voice and are, are dealing with very difficult circumstances. So our commitment to social justice was extraordinary. And uh, it was led by our players, but supported by our, our, our clubs and um, has been very impactful. And I'm incredibly proud of the work that we have done um, to help our communities um, and to make a difference uh, in each of these communities. There's still a lot of work to do, but I know the NFL has, has done a great deal and will continue to do that. That brings me to my last question. I know that you and Jane have two lovely twin daughters who just graduated from Dartmouth. Would you like to brag about them? <laughs> I don't know if I have enough time to brag about what I call my three girls between Jane and our two girls. Um, they're twins. Um, they are incredible young women that um, they're so grounded. Um, they're so successful in all right. They have so much to give to this world. Um, they are the most loving kids you'll ever have. They still like to hang out with their parents, which is amazes me every day. But um, Jane and I oftentimes um, tell ourselves how lucky we are, uh, how strong they are, and um, how good they are. And so we're incredibly proud of them, love them 
as much as you could ever love anything in the world. And so um, there are there are really for us um, our proudest achievements. Those two girls, Roger, you have uh, obviously a lot going on publicly with the NFL and being the commissioner and kind of uh, under a microscope. I guess I guess that's probably to say the least of it. But what's what are things that you personally have going on, either in the NFL or outside the NFL? that you're excited about in the future? We've talked a lot about kind of the past and how we got here, but what are things that you're looking forward to? You know, Troy, I'm really excited about um, the future of the NFL. I, I've said to our owners the last several years, the, the best days are ahead for uh, the NFL and our fans. Um, and our influence has grown so much. I think people expect so much for the NFL, and that raises the bar and the standards, which I think is good for us. I'm really excited about our international growth. I think we're going to be a global game. Um, We continue to play more games over there. We continue to focus our efforts there. Um, I I do believe the NFL is going to be a very popular game on a global basis. And the other one is is flag football, you know, finding other ways uh, for people to participate in our game in some fashion, particularly young women and Flag football has become uh, one of the fastest growing sports, particularly for young women, not just here in the States, but globally. And we're going to be an Olympic sport in the LA 28 Olympics uh, for both uh, men and women's uh, sports. And so I think that's that's really something I'm not only proud about, but I'm really excited about it because Again, you learn so much from playing the game. And I think playing flag football, you can share some of that. And it, it's it's more inclusive and it gives an opportunity for people who never had that opportunity um, in so many of our communities around the globe. And so that those two things are probably the thing I'm most excited about. Do you think there will be a, a lot of participation from NFL players in, that, in the Olympics? I know they want to. I, you know, every time um, – you know, NFL players express all the time, would I love to play in the Olympics and get a gold medal for my country? Absolutely. Uh, so I know that's something that um, we're still talking about with our clubs, uh, with the union. Um, there are a lot of considerations in that, but I, I do think that there will be NFL players participating in that. That'd be a lot of fun to watch. And then yeah. do you think uh, with the game's popularity growing so much in the future, you know, everything kind of an upward trajectory, do you think that the league would ever have more than 32 teams, either, you know, international teams or even in the States adding more teams locally? You know, Troy, uh, right now that's not under active consideration. I think where we look at expansion now is not in the number of franchises, but really in the globalization of the game and bringing the game. If you're effective in doing that, I think there are potential for us to have franchises uh, in international markets. I I definitely believe that is something that will be in the future as we globalize the game. When that'll be, I don't know uh, how that'll occur. I'm not sure yet. But, you know, I've said frequently um, the success we've had in London and more recently in Germany, I believe those markets could, could properly support an NFL franchise today. The trick is really how do we continue to make sure those franchises are competitively um, competitive with our U.S. franchises. And there are a lot of factors that go into that from scheduling to how the the rosters are built and how players, you know, the the access to players. A lot of considerations in there that um, aren't just the logistics. They're they're competitive factors that are really important for us to, to be able to deal with. There are things that we think about and we're trying to think down the road, but really the reality right now is to grow our game by playing games, regular season games, even preseason games, but also our media involvement and trying to make sure games get get exposed to our fans on a global basis. Roger, one of the things that uh, we try to end every podcast with is, so the goal of the podcast was to have interesting conversations, interesting people, all kinds of backgrounds. We didn't want to be just ALS or just sports or you know, my dad's got a very, uh, very uh, diverse background. And sure does. that's one of the things we wanted to lean into. So my question to you is, who are some people that you know, maybe two or three people that you think we should uh, try to reach out to to get on the podcast? Or you think would be good guests to help tell their story and, and uh, get their voice out there? 
Well, Troy, I say this in all honesty. I, there are very few people that I think are more successful than your father. Um, and I say that both personally and professionally. Um, there isn't anything Tim Green can't do. Um, and he didn't let ALS get in the way either. And so the inspiration um, that he is to all of us, and I know as your family, um, you feel it more than any of us, but um, he's a remarkable man. And um, I think anyone would be honored to be able to be part of this and be part of um, anything that's attached to Tim Green. And his fight for ALS, as you know, um, is you know is something we support, but we support it with a lot of pride and a lot of hope and a lot of um, encouragement that we're getting closer to a cure and a, and a solution here. And that um, that's the greatest legacy of all, besides our families, is being able to participate in some fashion to challenges like that that have affected so many individuals and so many families. So um, we're proud to support him and uh, think the work he's doing is amazing. Thank you. I am humbled by your kindness, my friend. Roger Goodell, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. You deserve everything that you have. Your story of fantastic determination and an indefatigable work ethic will inspire many. Well, thank you. Uh, a lot of people contributed to that and uh, were a part of the story. So my story is, is not one alone. It's, um, it's actually with the good fortune of a lot of great people around me. I, um, you mentioned mentors. Mentors are everything in life. Um, and you, you don't need just one. You need tens, if not hundreds. And I've been fortunate to have those folks in my life. So. And you're one of them. Thanks so much for uh, for making the time. I know you're extremely busy. We appreciate no, it. I, I'm glad to. Uh, it's glad I've enjoyed the time with you. you. You helped me forget about work for the last hour or so. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I look forward to see it. I hope you're coming down for a Rangers game. Go Rangers. Everybody's – they're going crazy down here. So, Roger, that's his new – he won't, miss a, he won't miss one second of a game. <laughs> it's fun to watch. I'm a big fan of, of playoff hockey in particular. But um, but when you know somebody on the ice, uh, <laughs> he's your future son-in-law, I'm sure it's even better. So They were all having a great season, but Adam's playing great. So it's, it's fun to watch. It may be the only jersey I own outside of football. <laughs> That's, That's a good player. point. <laughs> I think that's the only jersey outside of football in my in the whole green uh, clan. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, you know, talk about growth of a of a sport. HD TV did wonders for hockey. I remember watching when I was young; you couldn't see anything. Yeah, I you know it, it, it's done so much for sports in general. Just in the by the way, the next the next versions of those platforms, the next generations. Uh, make it even better it's just uh the only the only negative to all of it is it makes officiating harder because you all see it so much more than you saw before and then you say the officials don't get it right but um that's part of what we're doing and we use that same technology to help our officials uh do a better job but i'm really proud of what they do that's kind of part of the sport though right i mean like pete my i had an old football coach used to say it rains on both sides of the field like officials are going to miss calls, but they'll miss calls on both sides. It's, it, they can't be perfect unless you want to try to replace them with, you know, some kind of robotic, which then would be brutal the other way. Because there's technically you could probably call a penalty on every play if you look hard enough for it. Yeah. Like you say, it's part of the game and you you learn to adapt to it. And, um, you know, coaches, players, officials, um, commissioners, we all make mistakes. And so you just it's part of the game. Uh, and you benefit by it sometimes, and you sometimes are impacted negatively by it. But you, you, again, it's the same old thing. You got to persevere over it. You got to put yourself in a position to win, regardless of one call. It's a, the games aren't won and lost on one call. If the Rangers make it to the third round, we're going to get a box. If we pull the trigger, will you join us at the game? Love to see you, and love to. Whenever you come down, let me know. So, and if. Uh, 
I can always meet you over there too. Somehow I'll find a way over there. So. All right, we'll do it. We'll let you know. We got to root. We got to get to the. Let's get to the third round first. Exactly. Uh, it, yeah, there's probably one person named Adam who probably would not like us talking like this. So. <laughs> one 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 game at a time, right? One series at a time. That's right. But if you guys need anything, let me know. Um, I'm happy to try to help out too. Thanks again, Roger. Let's talk again soon. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing it. My pleasure. Always good to see you. Give my love to everyone, okay? We will. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Corps for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you liked today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.